If you've been looking for a newer certified Toyota, come be part of the team. With inventory arriving daily, we'll help you find a vehicle that works for your lifestyle and budget. We'll continue to ensure that your next buying experience is as safe and efficient as possible. Our service center is open with easy online scheduling and a quick clean process to get you back on the road safely. Head to teamtoyota.net and be safe, be strong, be a team. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Phillies Talk Podcast. He's Jim Salisbury, and I'm Corey Seidman. The Phillies are headed on to the third and final leg of this road trip in Milwaukee. After completing a series in Miami over the weekend, it was not a pretty series for the Phillies, but they were able to pull one out in the final game. And based on what the Braves did this weekend, no ground was lost, despite how um, dismal the first two nights of that weekend were for the Phillies. Yeah, they were very fortunate because they went down to Miami and Gosh, that, that place has given them so much trouble over the years. And um, it's easy to, you know, say that place. But, you know, the Marlins, you have to give them credit. They raised their game to play the Phillies. And honestly, Corey, this goes back to Jack McKeon. I mean, when Jack McKeon presided over some pretty good clubs down there and then when the Phillies were neck and neck, I'm talking like early 2000s, he used to really get up to play the Phillies. Um, him and Larry Boa had a history. Uh, going back to San Diego, and and they like to beat up on each other, and uh, McKeon liked to get onto Boa, Boa's skin, and McKeon just relished in the in the in the um, Marlins, you know, messing up Philly seasons and 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 things like that, and it's 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 almost like you know, 20 years later, it's it's the same thing. Um, so the Marlins take two or three, they did their job. Uh, some old bugaboos raised raised their kind of. Um, ugly head for the Phillies. I mean, the first game, they did not get a great start, a good start actually from Kyle Gibson, which was surprising because he has been really good since joining the Phillies. Uh, they also played poor defense in that game. The second game, they did not hit. They got poor bullpen. The third game, you know, Bryce Harper had been pretty quiet. He comes through with a big home run. Freddie Galvis, a big two, two run home run. And then, you know, they have offense kind of has trouble after that. They start with the runner on second to 10th and Oduble gets him in with, with two outs. And to me, the story of that game was the bullpen. They obviously used a bullpen game, the whole, all, all 10 innings. And um, how many times this year have we seen, and last year, we've seen the ninth inning get really nervous and they, they fumble away a, a, a one run lead because everybody gets tight. Well, Kennedy, Ian Kennedy came in and just settled that baby down. And he was, you know, calm and cool. I got this under control, four strikeouts of the six batters he faced. And I, I just think the whole team feeds off that calmness that he brings. So uh, a good job there with the bullpen to get out of there with one game. That, what are they, 12 and 19 in uh, Miami since the start of, of 2018. But it was important to come out, out of there with a victory just because we all know it's a problem spot for them, Miami. And they got to go back to the last week of the season. Games, um, you know, 160, 161, and 162 are in that ballpark. And, they could be the games of the season. The division could come down to them. You mentioned how close it is, two games with the Braves. Now the Mets are there at three and a half. Um, Phillies have a huge series in Milwaukee, followed by Colorado in Philadelphia for four games. And we know. So Colorado did the Phillies a big favor by being tough on the Braves out there in Denver. But Colorado's a totally different team when they're away from Denver. I mean, they're god-awful away from their home ballpark. So Phillies need to do well in Milwaukee. They need to come home and really clean up on the um, – on the on the Rockies who will be playing on the road but on that same trip the Rockies have to go to Atlanta so Atlanta will have that um, same opportunity uh, I know it's not like the world's greatest race but it's it's entertaining yeah uh, you know the Phillies did not hit in Miami they're going to need to turn that around here in September they they went 20 for 100 in those three games in Miami and they've hit they were hitting 215 against the Marlins to begin with this season leading into that series but you know, we're seeing the effects of no Reese Hoskins and JT Real Muto not really being like the top notch offensive performer that he was earlier in the season. Um, you know, Andrew McCutcheon had a big hit over the weekend, crushed a home run to center field. Bryce Harper and Freddie Galvis went deep on Sunday and Oduble Herrera swung a hot bat for all of August. But it really just seems like if the Phillies are going to score enough runs here, it's going to need to be playing situational baseball, doing the little things at the bottom of the order, just because you're six, seven, eight on most nights now, 
is not the way you drew it up by any means. Yeah, Joe's going to have to mix and match, ride some hot hands, but you're right. I mean, there was a game, I think, in Washington when they had a really good game at the bottom of that in that order. Uh, I think the night Verling came up. Um, but, yeah, it's just not the <clears throat> batting order that they had all year. They do miss Hoskins. Well, ha- uh, Harper was two for 13 uh, in uh, the first three games of September uh, before, you know, before Sunday had a, had a big home run. So, um, to me, that's not a big – drop ball the guy's gonna have a couple of bad games especially after the months of august that he had but the phillies are in such a precarious and and tenuous position like he can't even have two off days he's got to be bryce harper mvp candidate every blessed night and and somebody needs to emerge behind him um that can be some semblance of a dangerous bat so uh, uh, harper will get some pitches Uh, i guess more often than not that has to be mccutcheon um, does a really good job punishing mistakes. Streaky, they need him to go on one of their uh, one of his roles. Well, it's a difficult series for the Phillies early this week in Milwaukee. Brandon Woodruff, Zach Wheeler went in game one. The Phillies are also going to see Freddie Peralta in this series. I think in the finale, he's been very good. The Brewers have those three uh, damn near aces between Brandon Woodruff, Corbin Burns, and Freddie Peralta. They've been a great team like all season. The strange thing is that the Phillies swept them early in the season back in Philadelphia, like before all this took place for Milwaukee, I think they're 30 games over 500. What are they? They're yeah. 30 games over 500 as we begin the week. So very difficult series for the Phils. Maybe their toughest the rest of the season. If you look at the remaining schedule, I mean, there's the Pirates and the Orioles, Rockies, Cubs, bad teams like that, but this is going to be a test here, especially from an offensive standpoint. Yeah. They see uh, Woodruff, they see Peralta, they don't see Burns. Uh, but Woodruff and Peralta, both all-stars. Woodruff is, you know, right right there for the Cy Young. Uh, Zach Wheeler and him uh, hooked up in a great pitcher's duel in May in Philadelphia in that series that you mentioned where the Phillies swept the uh, Brewers. I remember um, Alec Baum hit a big home run late in, in that game. Um, but, you know, so it's interesting. The Phillies shuffled their rotation a little bit uh, before the Milwaukee series. Um, it, it's, it's gotten a lot of chatter. A lot of people are talking about it. Uh, in some ways, I think it's much ado about nothing because everybody gets the same amount of starts. Wheeler gets the same amount of starts. You've just lined, lined things up for the final week to optimize him. And also, which I think is big, he gets an extra day's rest before his start in Milwaukee. Uh, and, you know, he's coming off in August where he was, you know, um, he, had, he had slipped. He wasn't you know, elite level Zach Wheeler in the month of August. He had a 4.81 ERA in, I think, six starts. So um, uh, he was, you know, approaching ordinary. So uh, leading the league in uh, the majors and in innings, I think it's smart to give him that extra day of rest. And I think it's smart to line up the Milwaukee series with Wheeler, Nola, and Gibson. Um, you know, every one of those guys has a chance to be dominant on a given night. And then you go into Milwaukee. Uh, what it does is it allows you to go into Atlanta uh, to begin that final six-game road trip of the season, which could be huge, uh, with uh, the same trio of Wheeler, Nola, and Gibson against the Braves. And then uh, Wheeler would pitch the final day of the season, which potentially could be a play in game, or he'd be ready for, for, for the first game of the playoffs. So. I think it was smart to reshuffle this. You really not, you're only changing things kind of one day, but everybody's getting the same amount of starts. What what has come out of this um, alteration in the in the rotation is uh, they're going to be using a bullpen game um, six times over the final 27 games, and you know it started on Sunday, and they they got a really good job from the bullpen. Now they got five more of those bullpen games in the number five spot. And the reason they're in this predicament is Zach Eflin out for the season, likely. Uh, they just have no pitching depth that Joe Girardi trusts. Vinny Velasquez or Matt Moore, Chase Anderson's gone. So um, they're going to bullpen it, it sounds like, every fifth game. Um, and if they pitch as well as they did on Sunday, they'll be okay. The problem with that is, you know, you're kind of watching your bullpen the day before to make sure it's fresh and it might not be fresh the day after. So that really puts a um, kind of a, a level of importance on the other 
four starters to, to give you innings. So you're not leaning on your bullpen quite as much on those four days in between. So that bullpen is fully powered for that fifth, fifth game of the week. So uh, Joe thinks they can pull it off, but it's really up to the other four starters to give them some innings here. Uh, Aaron Nola has had his September struggles. They uh, reared their head again in Washington the other day with uh, really just two bad hanging curveballs, but paid a big price for those. Uh, he needs to turn it around. Gibson needs to come back from a poor start Friday night. Um, you know, we, we talk about offense. We talk about defense, which we know can be a killer on this team can really break their heart. But I really think starting pitching um, and on that fifth day, whatever they do in the bullpen, I really think pitching is going to starting pitching is going to determine how this team, if it's, if it stays in it. Um, and I, I, you know, they've been in it for four, for five plus months, no reason they shouldn't stay in it, but starting pitching, I think is going to, is going to really dictate if they, if they play in October or not. Well, when we talk about the Phillies using a bullpen game every fifth day, it's not as if they're replacing somebody who was going seven innings in that spot. Like it was Matt Moore in that spot recently, and he was giving you about four innings. So you know, you look at what happened Sunday. It was Sam Coonrod for four outs. It was Bailey Falter who picked up seven outs. So the two of them nearly took down those four innings that you would have gotten from Matt Moore. But it just means that you're using those guys. You're, you're locking yourself into like two pitchers there at the beginning of the game to get through those early innings. Uh, yeah, the Phillies could feel the effects of it. Uh, that, that's why you hope Zach Wheeler goes deep and continues to go deep. You mentioned that he had the 481 ERA in August. It was a little strange because it didn't feel like he got hit that hard. Um, there were in his most recent start, he dealt with a lot of like soft hits that went through. He had two games in that stretch in August, one against the Diamondbacks, one against the Tampa Bay Rays, where he gave up most of the runs in his final inning. I think it was, right. uh, he gave up like five runs to the Rays in the eighth and ninth inning, he gave up all those runs to the Diamondbacks in his final inning. So kind of skewed the overall line, but as a collective, you know, Aaron Nola had a five, four, six ERA in August. Kyle Gibson had a four, seven, nine, just beneath wheelers. Again, a little skewed because Gibson did give up eight runs in his most recent start. But the best starter for the Phillies in the month of August was Ranger Suarez, who had an ERA below two in his first month back in the Phillies rotation. He only went five innings the other night in Miami. It looked to be cruising. He had seven strikeouts through five scoreless innings. He was at 71 pitches. Joe Girardi decided to pull him. It was a decision that initially was met with some you know, questioning, but uh, Girardi and Suarez both said that the pitcher is dealing with a little bit of fatigue in his triceps. Uh, Suarez was coming off starts of 99 and 95 pitches, the two highest pitch counts of his career. Uh, you asked Joe Girardi on Sunday, how serious does this Ranger Suarez injury feel? It's tough to ever really get the, I guess, the total 100% truth when you ask the Phillies about injuries these days. But uh, does this seem like something that could impede Suarez in the month of September? Uh, Joe doesn't think... It will be, nor does Ranger, but you never know. Like you mentioned there, Joe, Joe in particular is seldom completely uh, forthcoming on, on the nature and the severity of injuries. Um, but, you know, f what was it? Uh, what night did he pitch down Miami? Saturday night? Saturday night. Saturday night, you know, well, like you said, I was watching him cruising along and then Hector's up in the bullpen. You're like, what the heck's going on? And he's out of the game and, um, you know, Afterward, Joe said uh, he had experienced tightness in his tricep. Uh, Suarez, after the game, said he had had some tightness in his tricep. And um, when you look at the advanced metrics, and they have access to all this stuff during the game, they have people watching this stuff on, uh, on the computers. Sometimes it's right in the tunnel behind the dugout. Sometimes it's in a back room. But they're in constant contact. I mean, his spin rate was down all night on, on, his, on his total repertoire of pitches. And his velocity was down. So that, I mean, that's, a, that's a telltale. That can be a red flag. So when you were watching some, some um, stiffness in the tricep, maybe just because of the buildup of innings, dead arm, whatever the hell you want to call it. But you know, when you, when you, when you have that symptom and then you have that science, that data spin rate and the velocity decline, you, you have a responsibility to get him out of the game. You can't hurt him for, for his next start. You can't hurt, hurt him down the road. You can't hurt him period. Their responsibility to keep your athletes healthy. So uh, he had to come out of that game uh, as much as it hurts. But uh, hopefully it is just like one of those things where he's been ramped up and he's plateaued a little bit and he needs to kind of bust through that brick wall a little bit and get back on track in his next start here, which would be at home against Colorado uh, because they really need him because I think he's very good. Um, and, I, you know, you'd hate to see him 
come down with a, an arm issue, it's going to, even a minor one, it's going to affect them the rest of the way. So I think they were cautious there, and, and rightfully so. They had to be because pitching arms, and, and you just don't mess with an athlete's career. Uh, I know Joe took a lot of heat for it, but it, to me it was the right move. And um, we'll see if he can rebound, and they say it's not serious uh, because, you know, they, they're, they're so thin in the rotation. They can't afford to anybody to get out here in the final 26 games. Jim, we haven't talked about the Mets in, uh, in in relation to the NL East race in a long time. I mean, I know we talked last week about all the uh, the uh, issues they were going through coming off of that Javier Baez booing the fan type thing, but the Mets have won eight of their last nine games, and they've been hitting lately with that lineup, uh, which has been has played most of the season below its actual talent level, but Mets have won eight of nine. They entered the week just a game and a half behind the Phillies. Those two teams meet next weekend at City Field. So this isn't just a two-team race necessarily anymore. Uh, no, Phillies are two out. The Mets are three and a half out uh, going into Labor Day. Uh, and, and you're right. They were so inconsistent with the bats all year long, and all of a sudden now they're swinging them. Uh, it looked like that incident with the fans, they were going to implode and, and just go away. And in a weird way, maybe it's rallied them. Yeah. I mean, I don't get it. I, I still think what they did, thumbs down, downing the fans was was awful. And I still would have, I still would have said goodbye to Baez on the spot, uh, made a statement if you're trying to tr change the culture. But all of a sudden, the best way to change the culture is winning ball games, and and they are playing better and, and, and doing that. So, uh, wouldn't that just be perfect um, in this race of 2021? This kind of race race through the ruins as it is. Uh, if the Mets, you know, you know, make this really interesting down the stretch and they are making it interesting down the stretch. They took care of business against a bad team in Washington. Now they go to Miami. Will Miami toughen up and, and play them as tough as they play the Phillies? Uh, the Phillies certainly hope so. Uh, we'll see. Jim, the Phillies struggles in Miami, getting back to that for a second. I, I wonder how much you think it has to do with the fact that the light, the atmosphere in Miami is just so lifeless. I know that every visiting team goes there and has to deal with it, but I mean, do you think that that plays into anything as, as it pertains to the Phillies? They seem to just go down there and they just don't hit whenever they go to Miami. It's a big ballpark, but we also just see like a lack of energy across the board. It seems. I don't know. There's a lot of pockets of the season. They don't hit. I actually, in a weird way, think you can make that dead environment down there work for you because it's not like you're going into, yes, the, the, no, there's not a lot of energy in the ballpark. There's not a lot of fans, but there's also not a lot of hostile energy. And a lot of the fans that are there, the 3,000 fans that are there, uh, if you look around and having gone down there for years, uh, uh, they're wearing red. They're wearing Phillies garb. They're relocated Philadelphians. They're, you know, Philadelphians on vacation. They do get some support down there. And, you know, the only crowd that matters the only crowd that matters is the 35 people in your dugout and, and build on that energy. And, and when you have a big inning, explode in the dugout and, and ride the energy of the 25 or 40 people in your dugout and make that work for you. And, and just, you know, go in there and band together and, and use the dead environment as a kind of a, a rallying point, like almost, say to yourself, like, you know, we're going to just own this place. It, it's dead. They can't even draw their own fans over here. Let's, let's, let's own this place. Let's just go out and own it. So in terms of bringing your own energy, I, I think uh, a dead ballpark is no excuse. You, you got to go out there and bring your own energy. Unfortunately, it's like the chicken and the egg. Sometimes when you don't hit, you, you don't, you lack that energy. And they often don't hit in Miami. And one of the realities is Miami raises its game to play the Phillies. For some reason, I talked about it. it's going. It's been going on for twenty years, and even when they're rebuilding and even when they're lousy, they always seem to come come at you with some arms. They really do, you know. Alcantara, Jose a few years ago, Jose Urena, uh, this kid Trevor Rogers. Um, boy, what a nice left-hander he is. Um, we haven't even seen Sixto Sanchez this year. That's another young building block they have in their rotation as well. Yeah, Sixto Sanchez, former Philly guy, probably be back next year. Yeah, so they always seem to come at you with some arms. Uh, and they got a guy, they got a real character player, this, this uh, Rojas, uh, Miguel Rojas plays hard. Uh, so they, they show a lot of fight the, against the Phillies. And um, 
you know, the Phillies have to figure out a way to show that same fight. Like I said, they go down there for the final three games of the season. Um, they might have to be your three best games of the season. And it's a topic that comes up amongst the Phillies themselves. Archie Bradley and Ian Kennedy both saying this weekend that they've heard so much about um, the Phillies-Marlins rivalry and the fact that the Marlins really cost the Phillies a, a chance at making the playoffs last year by beating the Phillies so much in September. Kennedy did his part Sunday with those two innings, picked up the win to close out the game. Um, he saved, uh, what is it, six out of seven in his chances as a Philly. They haven't all been clean, but he, you know, he seems to be kind of settling in here what have you thought about him overall? And he's a guy who's on a, you know, a short-term deal here, two months, and then he's a free agent. Do you think the Phillies would consider bringing him back with all the bullpen issues they've been having? Um, if, if you're not considering bringing him back, something's wrong. The job he's done, just the, the calmness he brings to a, a crazy position. You know, we've seen all hell breaking loose in the ninth inning around here for years. He really has a way to calm it down, a way of calming it down. And if you feel you can, you can upgrade at that position, I think he can pitch in this seventh or the eighth and be quite productive i certainly would consider bringing him back um i think you have to just for the job he's done he's just brought brought, brought he, he just feel like he knows what he's doing out there he's not um frenzied by the the situation uh and you know hector Neris has done a great job since they dropped him back into a setup role uh that's a pretty good mix but i use hector as an example when, he, when he's closing he has those good pockets but then when things go bad, you can, you can just see it on his face. You know, his face is clenched. His body language is, 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 is of a man in trouble. And, and you just can't let the ball go uh, with, any, with any life or any, you know, have its natural movement or make it do what you want without that finish. And you're not going to get any finish when you're tight um, and you're anxious. Uh, this Kennedy has a way of staying calm and just handling the situation and throwing strikes. And, um, you know, I think about that. Was it the Dodgers game he closed out at home when, when Joe Girardi got ejected through a lot of strikes and, and the umpire was squeezing him terribly and uh, the ballpark's angry, the manager's angry. Ian Kennedy, yeah, just keep throwing strikes. I got to get five outs, I get five outs. I mean, he was dominant down in Miami, did, did a really great job. Even his interview on the TV with Tommy McCarthy after the game, um, did you know you were going to pitch two innings? And he said, well, they kind of mentioned it down in the bullpen. Uh, and his answer, his response to that was really level-headed and mature and calm and smart. He said, well, let's see how the first one goes. <laughs> and that, mm -hmm. You know, he didn't like bang his head and say, yeah, I can get him coach, you know, like Rudy. I mean, and, and you need to keep your emotions in check in that position. And that answer was a perfect, um, was a, a perfect illustration of just how he keeps his emotions in check and um, goes out there and does his job. I thought he was a real key contributor in that game because now you're going to go out for the bottom of the 10th and this, Oh, you turn around, there's a runner on second base and that runner immediately moves up. And now he's, you know, the tying runs 90 feet away. He gets two strikeouts with the tying run on third. And honestly, did you really feel like that game was in jeopardy? I didn't. I felt like it was over. Even with the runner on third, I felt like this guy, he's got the body language that's of a guy that says, I'll get this done. And he got this done. And you know, there are a lot of ways to close ball games. I look at the way Melanson does it with that, you know, cutter, cutter, cutter. And Trevor Hoffman used to do it with change up, change up, change up. And other guys just do it with, you know, pure gas. Um, but, you know, and some guys are walking tight ropes. They allow base runners. They get out of it. The most important stat for closers, in my opinion, has always been handshakes. Do you, do you get handshakes after the game? And Ian Kennedy has a way of getting handshakes after the game. Uh, but I do like the um, just the poise and the calmness he brings to that ninth inning because when your closer starts getting nervous and tight, everybody around you starts getting nervous and tight, and seldom do, do good things happen when that, that occurs. Well, the Phils are hoping for some more handshakes this week. They have the Brewers and Rockies this week, the Cubs and Mets next week, the Orioles and Pirates after that, and then they close out the season with the Braves and Marlins. A lot of easy games in there, but the Phils got to take care of business. That's going to do it for this podcast. He's Jim Salisbury. I'm Corey Seidman. Talk to you later in the week.